Welcome to the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord and make his path straight. And we invite you to like us on Facebook, the voice of crying in the wilderness, where you can download all our messages or email us at a v o o c 2019 at gmail.com. And, uh, and you can request a message to be emailed. Again, we have our pastor, Michael Martin. And I'll be turning the call over to him, Pastor Martin. The time is now yours. We are continuing uh, in the message out of the city into the wilderness, a neglected blessing. Um, this is uh, a message that many possibly may have not heard before or may be new to some, um, but it is uh, an amazing blessing as we look at it uh, from the scriptures. Uh, we did the first part of it, um, seek to finish that message, and let's uh, take a moment to pray um, before we go into the word, and then we'll go right into our message. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are thankful once again for this day, especially we ask now in the name of Christ that as we study the word, that your spirit would overshadow us, that you would give us your grace, your mercy, your blessings, that you would pour upon us your spirit in such a measure that we would be different people eternally. Bless us now as we study that we might grasp the principles of your scriptures. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, and I would read in your hearing verses 6 and 14. Revelation chapter 12, verses 6 and 14. And the scripture says, And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there, a thousand two hundred and threescore days. Go with me also to verse 14. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time, times, and half a time, from the face of the serpent. So when we look at both of these texts, in verses 6 as well as verse 14, of course, the word woman in Bible prophecy is uh, a symbolic word for church. So during the time of the Dark Ages, from 538 to 1798, this was the time when the Church of Rome, the Roman Catholic hierarchy organization, ruled the world with an iron fist. And those individuals that would get baptized, they could be persecuted. If they did not come to Mass, they could be persecuted. If their children were baptized, they could be persecuted. If they owned Bibles, they could be persecuted. If they left the Church of Rome to become Protestants, they could be persecuted. So the woman, the Protestant Church, God gives 
a space in the wilderness. And so you find many different churches. You find the the uh, church in Ethiopia in the wilderness for a thousand years, and uh, the Church of Rome did not know that that church was in existence. You find the uh, Waldensians that went up into the mountains. You found, find the Huguenots that went into the French Alps. You you find all these different groups of individuals where it was necessary for them to go into the wilderness to escape persecution. But much more than that, notice what the text says in verse 6. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they, who's the they, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days, so one thousand two hundred and sixty years, from five thirty eight to seventeen ninety eight. The church is being fed. The church is being fed the word of God, the 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 fundamental doctrines and beliefs. Uh, many of the Waldensians were Sabbath keepers, so the, the Sabbath was early being introduced uh to uh uh individuals. The original St. Patrick, the real St. Patrick, he was a Sabbath keeper. Go to verse 14. And to the woman were given two wings, wings always indicating speed of a great eagle. So we know that eagles fly very swiftly. They, they are born into their heavenward heights uh, by wind currents. Two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished. So here's the church being nourished time, times, half a time. This is the same prophecy, 1,260 days. A time in Bible prophecy is 360 days. The the Jewish year was 360 days. Times, that would be two years. That would be 720 or two times 360 and half a time would be half of a year, which would be 180. You add all that together, you get 1260, the same prophecy, where she is nourished for time, times, and half a time from the face of the serpent. So from the face of Satan, so from the face of her persecutors. And at that time, the persecutors was the Church of Rome. Verse 15, and the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood, after the woman. Now that that water, you find the definition for that water in Revelation 17 in verse 15. Let's read that text. Go to Revelation 17 and verse 15. Revelation 17 and verse 15, and it says, And he said unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples, multitudes, and nations and tongues. So, so this 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 whore, which the Bible has defined very thoroughly and very definitely as uh, the Roman Catholic hierarchy or or Romanism or the religion of the popes rules over all these different kinds of peoples and multitudes and nations. So they came after the woman, and the woman, the Church, Protestantism fled into the wilderness. So back to Revelation 12 and verse 15. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood. So that's a lot of a lot of people came after the church that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman. How did the earth help the woman? Because the church ran into the wilderness. They couldn't find all of God's people. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood so the people, you know, got lost. They couldn't they couldn't find it. Sometimes they were so far up in the mountains. And the dragon cast uh which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Verse seventeen, and the dragon was raw with the woman. So when you look at this you can see that part of our spiritual preparation is wilderness living. That's part of our spiritual preparation. For the last Battle Now, is that to say that no one that resides in the city as a child of God will be prepared 
for the last battle. No, it is not to say that. But as God opens the way, because some will have to flee out of the cities at the last moment, but we should be praying, Lord, open the way that I may find a place in the country, in the wilderness, in the desolate and solitary places, in the mountaintops, uh, in, in the deep forest, that I may be free from the interference of, of enemies. So this is early on uh, in the church, but we are seeing how it comes up to today in verse 17. The dragon was robbed with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So we are, we are very soon to be right in the middle of that war. All you have to do is look around you and you see things changing. So go with me to Isaiah chapter 33. Isaiah 33 and verse 16. Isaiah 33 and verse 16. Isaiah 33 and verse 16. Notice what the scripture says. Let's read verses 15 and 16. He that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly, he that despises, despises the gain of oppression. You know what the, the gain of oppression is? That's when you don't pay people right. That's when somebody's worth twenty dollars an hour and you pay them ten. They're worth thirty dollars an hour and you pay them fifteen. And shaking his hands from holding bribes won't take any bribes. Stopping his ears from the hearing of blood, shutting his eyes from seeing evil, not going to filthy movies and all that kind of stuff. He that he shall dwell on high, his place of defense shall be in the munitions of the rocks. The defenses of the rocks. Where is the rocks found out? It found in the mountains. Then the scripture says, bread shall be given him and his waters shall be sure. This is a promise. God says when, when the, the testing time comes and there is no way for us to provide food for ourselves, God says our bread and waters will be sure. He'll, he will take care of us. But up until that time, we must be preparing. So this is why there's a list of reforms, as it were. If we were to go back and study, we would find out that even Jesus uh, was raised uh, in a country home. If you, if you go back and look at Nazareth, Nazareth was a mountain village, and he, he lived out in the country in a little, in, in, in a little cabin with, his, with Joseph and Mary, in that little mountain village of Nazareth. It was a small little, and so, of course, wherever they worked, in the center of that little village, there was more people, but the houses were scattered abroad, and scattered abroad in different places. Go with me to Psalm 78. Psalm 78 is a very interesting psalm. Psalm 78, verses 52 to 54, that gives some of the history of the children of Israel. Psalm 78, 78, division of the Psalm, verses 52 to 54. Psalm 78, verses 52 to 54. And the scripture says, He made, but He made His own people to go forth like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. He led them on safely so that they feared not, and the sea overwhelmed their enemies. It's talking about when they went through the Red Sea. And he brought them to the border of his sanctuary, even to this mountain, once again, in the wilderness, which his right hand had purchased. He cast out the heathen also before them and divided them an inheritance by line and made the tribes of Israel to dwell in their tents. So very, 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 very interesting. So, you know, his, his sanctuary 
was out in the wilderness. He led them through the wilderness. Their, their wilderness journey was actually a preparation for the promised land. So let's go back and look at something that we looked at in our message this morning. Children of Israel came out of Egypt. Egypt is a symbol of the world. They came out of the world. Egypt was full of cities. Children of Israel were living in Goshen. They were living in the land. They weren't living in a city. They passed through the Red Sea. That's a symbol of baptism. Then they came into the wilderness, and they journeyed through the wilderness for for 40, uh, for 40 years. That was the time for them to build character. The same thing happened in the life of Christ. God sent Joseph and Mary into Egypt, and then he called them out of Egypt. He came to his own dwelling place uh, in Nazareth, and then uh, later on he was baptized by John, and then in Matthew 4, he goes into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. So the church today is called out of Egypt, called out of the world, called to the water. Once you, because of conversion, you're called to the water for baptism, and then he calls us to the wilderness, character preparation, and preparation for the great last crisis. This is what we see taking place in Scripture. Go with me to Matthew chapter 3 in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 3, and we see a very interesting text, these texts that's dealing with John the Baptist. John the Baptist. In Matthew chapter 3, Matthew chapter 3, starting in verse 1, and we'll read a few of these verses. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness. This is very interesting. So John John's preaching is in the wilderness, and the people come out to the wilderness. So John, as it were, had an outpost, and people came to him, saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by Esaias, that's Isaiah, so Isaiah prophesied about John the Baptist. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Follow this carefully now. Watch this now. The St. John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins. In other words, he dressed very plainly. He didn't wear showy clothes. We don't see where John had on any jewelry. John didn't have on any makeup. We don't see that where John uh, had any long hair and long fingernails and all that. We don't see that. All right? John was very plain. Now notice this. Notice the next part of the text. And his meat, the word meat means food, was locusts and wild honey. Now many preachers, when they read this text, they think that this, uh, this locust, they think that it is talking about um, this uh, insect that looks very much like a grasshopper, that even in the Old Testament, God said that his people could eat locusts in an emergency situation, all right? But this is not what John is eating. The locust that John is eating came from a tree called the locust tree, all right? And the locust tree has a pod that, that produces, uh, it looks like, it looks almost like a large bean, And that's what John was eating. So John was a vegetarian. John was a strict vegetarian. So let's read on a little bit about John's ministry. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. So John is an Israelite, and John is involved in ministry to the 
Israelites or to the Jewish church. So there were people in the Jewish church that needed to be rebaptized. Verse 6, and were baptized of him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. Verse 7, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees, many of the church leaders, come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth fruits, meat for repentance. In other words, by your lifestyle, you should show that you have genuine repentance. And think not to say to to yourselves, we have Abraham, our father. In other words, they're saying, well, we were born in the church. That doesn't guarantee you anything. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Verse 10, now is the axe. Now also the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. So what is the good fruit? The good fruit is Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, and all of you should, you, you, you should know those texts, all right? The fruit of the Spirit. If you don't have the fruit of the Spirit, if we don't bear the fruit of the Spirit, sooner or later, we will be cut down by God himself. John says, verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear, He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So this is what we must be preparing for. We must be preparing for the Holy Spirit baptism and fire. The Holy Spirit baptism is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which gives us complete victory over sin. In the early reign of the Holy Spirit, that gives us victory over sin in the process of justification, sanctification, and perfection. All those things go together. We'll have to do another message on that at some time so that you will be able to see that, you know, clearly. We won't go into the depths of it right now. But then it says, shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. And this is written in this way because the baptism of fire comes after the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's the baptism of trials. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you won't be able to stand the trials that will come. Verse 12 says, whose fan is in his hand, he will thoroughly purge his floor. This this word floor means church. So don't burden yourself over the condition of the church because here's the promise that God is going to purge it. So if you are not seeking for being clean, if you are not seeking for God to cleanse you, don't worry, God will one day clean, clean you out. In other words, you'll be out of the church. Whose fan is in his hand, he will thoroughly purge his floor, he will thoroughly purge the church, and gather the wheat, that's his people, into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff, that's those that don't want to be saved, refuse to be saved, reject salvation, don't want to be fathered, they will be burned, burned the chaff with unquenchable fire, which means they'll be completely burned up in hell fire. It doesn't mean that they'll be burned forever. That, that burning forever is something that came from the Greeks, and the Greeks gave it to the Romans, and the Romans gave it to the church, and some people are still preaching and teaching that, you know, either, either in ignorance or even in stubbornness. Which one? I do not know. All right? So let's go now to, to 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse... 10. And after that, then we'll go to 1 Kings. 2 Kings, chapter 5, <clears throat> and verse 10. And this is the story of Naaman. So Naaman is a leper. He's a, he's a Syrian, a Syrian captain. And he, 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 he comes, he ends up... The short of the story, he ends up coming to Elisha, you know, and, and, and he wants to he wants to be cleansed of his leprosy. And in verse 10, and Elisha sent a messenger unto him saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou and thou shalt be clean. So now 
Now, he sends him to the wilderness. The Jordan, if you know anything about the Jordan River, the Jordan River is a very muddy river. And so he's very upset. He's very upset that Elisha has sent him to this muddy river, and he, he complains and says, well, don't, don't we have better rivers in my own land? And so his servants say, well, if, if the man of God had asked you to do something difficult, wouldn't you have done it? And he agrees with him, so he, he goes and he begins to dip himself in the Jordan, and he dips down, you know, five times, six times. His flesh is still the same, and then the, the seventh time, and his flesh comes like that of a child. No more leprosy. So what are we seeing here is God's blessing to a difficult task, but God's blessing upon obedience. This is what God is trying to help us to see. God has special blessings for obedience. Now, my personal testimony is that when we moved back into the country, we, we lived in the country in Tennessee, Alabama, uh, Mississippi, uh, Africa. When we moved back in the country into this particular place. The house was in pretty rough shape. Now, I'm a carpenter by trade, so that's... Uh, that's not a that's not a big journey for me. I can look at something and see what could be done to it quickly. But before we moved, my wife was very burdened. And she kept praying, Lord, we want to be out of the city and into the country. And the Lord impressed her, well, if she's serious, to begin to pack. And she began to pack, and then this place was, shown to us, we we remembered it and came out and looked at it and it was it needed a lot of work. And so the Lord put us on this journey and and uh and we started taking care of one thing after another and and it has really begun to shape up but it's it has been a journey. So it it might be that the Lord might call you to a place where you think that mm, I'm not gonna live in that you know and the Lord might have something in store for you, or you might, it might be more than one family together. But, beloved, I want to tell you, it is very serious that we get out of these cities, because many of these cities are going to be visited with judgments from God, and you don't want to be there when buildings start falling down. Some by earthquake, some by fire, some by flood. Some are going to be struck with lightning from heaven, and they're going to, and people are going to say, oh, well, that's a concrete building. That's going to happen to it, and those buildings are going to burn up and become rubble. Because many of them have been built only out of a sense of men's pride. These skyscrapers have been built out of a sense of men's pride, one man trying to outdo another man in their, in their building feats. And God has to humble the pride of man. Go with me to 1 Kings chapter 19. First Kings, chapter 19, First Kings, chapter 19, and verse 19. Now, this is the call of Elisha. This is, this is Elijah. God tells Elijah to go and give Elisha the call into prophetic office because God is very soon going to Take Elijah to heaven. So, First Kings chapter nineteen, verse nineteen. First Kings nineteen nineteen. The scripture says, "So he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him, and he with the twelfth. And Elisha passed him by and cast his mantle upon him. So he had this. It looked like a robe, and he took his robe." Elijah takes his robe off of him and puts it on Elisha. So notice where he finds him. He finds him in a field in the country plowing. He's busy doing the Lord's work of farming the land. And that's when the prophetic call comes to Elisha. And if you will 
study Elijah carefully and Elisha carefully, you'll find that Elisha performed twice as many miracles as Elijah, and he asked for a double portion. So very, very interesting in the scriptures. Now let's go to a very familiar psalm. Let's go to the 23rd psalm. Very familiar psalm. And many of you already know this psalm. Many of you can quote this psalm without reading it. But this psalm is a psalm dealing with the wilderness. 23rd psalm. It's called the Psalm of David. Only six verses. And it says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. In other words, God says he's going to be the provider. So shepherds provide. That's the job of a shepherd. A pastor is supposed to provide. A pastor is supposed to provide meat and spiritual meat and spiritual uh, food and spiritual bread and spiritual milk for his congregation. That's what a pastor is supposed to provide. But if the pastor himself does not enjoy meat, then you think he will give it to you? So it's very important that you are under a shepherd that can provide meat. He said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In other words, he's not going to want for things spiritually. But then in this case, talking about God, you're not going to want for anything. Whatever it is that you need, God has promised to provide it. Verse 2 says, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. Where do you find pastures? You definitely don't find pastures in the, in the city. You find pastures in the wilderness. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Why, why is this? Because sheep will not drink from a rapidly flowing stream. The shepherd has to take some rocks and, and dam up a spot where the water is still. That's where the sheep will come and drink from. But if they, they'll stand there at a rapid and they'll, they'll be standing there going thirsty because they won't drink from that rapidly moving water. It's very interesting. Scripture goes on to say, He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So, so we have, when we are converted, that is the beginning process of soul restoration. We need to be restored to the image that God gave to Adam. And so this, this message of being out of the cities is part of it because it is an aid to our spiritual advancement. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So that his, he leads me in those righteous paths so that his name or his character can be glorified. Not my character, not my name, but God's name. Verse 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and we're definitely in the shadow of death on this planet, anywhere you go, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff they comfort me, a symbol of God's power. Rod and staff, they comfort me, a symbol of the Holy Spirit. You get comfort from the Holy Spirit. Thou pre- preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Okay, so we're on this world, and even though we may be far, far away from people, we're still in the presence because we're in the same environment. In other words, we're still on the same planet, but God prepares a, a, a table for us in the presence of our enemies. He, thou anointest my head with oil. So we, are, we get an anointing from the Holy Spirit. Of course, Christ is ultimately our head, and he was definitely had an anointing that no one else has, has ever had. Now, we can have a similar anointing. We can get to the point where we live the rest of our life without sin, but Jesus lived his entire life without sin. My cup runneth over. That's, that's, that's your vessel. That's your, that's your life. 
So he's going to fill your life to overflowing with the Holy Spirit and with the goodness of God. Verse 6, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. Goodness and mercy shall go with me wherever you go all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The house of the Lord is the sanctuary, and once once this battle is over and there's no longer need for the sanctuary, we'll dwell in heaven. That's God's house. So this is this is a very, very interesting, I gave you just a short synopsis uh, of that psalm. You can actually do an entire message on that psalm, or you could actually take each one of these verses and 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 do an entire message on each verse in this psalm. All right, so let's go a little further now. Let's go to Mark chapter 1 and verse 35, and let's look at the prayer habits of Jesus. Jesus' prayer habit. Where did Jesus like to pray? Mark chapter 1 and verse 35. Mark chapter 1 and verse 35. And the scripture says, And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place, that means in the wilderness or in the woods, and they're prayed. So he went to some place where he could be by himself, out in nature, away from other people, where he would not be heard, where he had privacy, where he would not be interrupted and prayed. That was Jesus' prayer habit. So we have to develop a similar prayer habit. But if we're already in the country, the only thing we have to do is step out the front door. Or step out the back door. Or go on the back porch. Or go sit at the picnic table. Whatever your your place is. But you need to have a solitary place to pray. And if you're in the city, the only place you have, as, as Jesus say, enter into your closet. Go into your closet. Shut the door where you won't be bothered. Where you where you won't be interrupted. Where you won't be disturbed. Well, you won't disturb anybody else and pour out your soul before God. That was Jesus' prayer habit. Go with me to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 49. Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 49, verses 8 through 10. Isaiah chapter 49, verses 8 through 10. And the scripture reads, Thus saith the Lord, In an acceptable time I have heard thee, and in the day of salvation have I helped thee, and I will preserve thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people to establish the earth, and to cause to inherit the desolate heritages. Desolate heritage, that's in the wilderness. So God says he's going to cause you to inherit. He has a way of providing for you your place. Verse 9 says, That thou mayest say to the prisoners, Go forth to them that are in darkness, show yourselves. They shall feed in the ways and their pastors shall be in the in all high places. Talking about the mountains now. Notice verse 10. They shall not hunger nor thirst, neither shall the heat nor the sun smite them. For he hath mercy on them, and shall lead them even by springs of water, shall guide them. This is, this is two, twofold now. Twofold. He's talking about spiritual provisions, and he's talking about physical provisions, that you're going to have water. You're not going to starve. You're not going not to die of thirst. Verse 11, and I will make all my mountains away, and my highways shall be exalted. God has a way of providing for his people. I never forget, I had a friend 
I won't call his name. His mother was a call porter. She was one of those individuals that went into the community and sold the religious book. She sold a great controversy and desire of ages and ministry of healing and all those different books. And so she was impressed of the Lord that she needed a vehicle to do her work, but she was not financially able. So the Lord impressed her to go to this particular car dealership. And so she went to this car dealership and She explained to the people what she did and what she needed, and the owner of the car dealership came out, and he said, well, just go and pick out the car you want. She went out and picked out the car she wanted. She came back to the office, and he filled out the paperwork, and he said, the car is yours. She picked out a brand-new station wagon. I don't remember what kind it was. And so she went back to the church and gave her testimony And other people started going to the car dealership (laughs) thinking that they were going to get a free automobile like she did. And all of them were turned down. (laughs) But because this woman was doing God's work and, and she had an experience with God and she had a closeness with God, God provided a way for her that she did not even know, but she stepped out on faith and God provided the way. God is going to do the same thing for many of us that are seeking uh, to to move out into the wilderness. Go with me, still in the book of Isaiah. Let's go back. We're going to Isaiah 35. Go to Isaiah chapter 35. It's a few chapters back. Isaiah 35 and verse 1. Isaiah 35 and verse 1. And the scripture says, The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. All right, so 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 God is gonna let you know that 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 there's you're gonna find happiness. It's almost like that the wilderness rejoices when the people of God comes. This is this is what God is talking about. Um go with me to to Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel 36. And we'll read verses 33 to 35. Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36. Verses 33 to 35. Notice what the scripture says. Thus saith the Lord God, in the day that I have cleansed you from all your iniquities, I will cause you to dwell in the cities and wastes shall be built. Now this may sound confusing as what we have studied, but originally when God gave to the children of Israel the city of Jerusalem, there were other smaller cities right around them. So why would he do this? instead of putting him in the country, because God intended that all those cities should be dwelt in by Jews, and every last one of those Jews would be living in a righteousness. But because of the condition of the world today, and everyone is not in righteousness, he has to send us out away from the cities. Because if the Jews had been obedient to God, the city of Jerusalem would have been standing today, and we could have been called Jews, and not what we'll call now. But because they were disobedient, God had to raise up Protestantism, and then after Protestantism, had to raise up Adventism, and an Adventist is simply a person that looks forward to the second coming of Jesus. So most Christians all the way around the world are Adventists, but they are not Sabbath keepers yet. And so when you are a Seventh-day Adventist, it simply means you are looking forward to the second coming of Christ and hastening to that day, and you keep all of his commandments, including the seventh-day Sabbath. Verse 34 says, And the desolate land shall be tilled. That's the wilderness. The desolate land shall be tilled. Where is it laid desolate in the sight of all that pass by? Verse 35, And they shall say, This land that was desolate 
is become like the Garden of Eden. God's going to bless your hands if you get out and steal the desolate places. So as I, as I read these texts, the Lord spoke to my mind that there are many, many blessings in the earth that we have not gotten out of the earth. It would be like the Garden of Eden and the waste and the desolate and the ruined cities are become fenced and are inhabited. All right, go with me to Genesis, Genesis 27. Genesis, all the way back into the beginning of your Bible, first book in the Bible, Genesis 27. Our next three areas of Scripture will be in Genesis. Genesis 27, Genesis 27, verses 26 and 28. Genesis 27, verses 26 down to 28. And his father Isaac said, Come near now and kiss me, my son. And he came near, and he kissed him and smelled the smell of his raiment, and blessed him and said, See, the smell of my son is as the smell of a field. So he just had a very fresh smell, the air of the out of doors, which the Lord has blessed. The field which the Lord has blessed. Therefore, God give thee of the dew of heaven. This is a dual blessing. It's talking about for his crops to be watered, and it's also talking about the Holy Spirit. And the fatness of the earth. So this is talking about the earth bringing forth plentifully, and plenty of corn and wine. So he's going to have uh, uh, standing ears of corn, and he's going to have uh, vineyards, all right? So this is the blessing that, that God is blessing through Isaac to Jacob, all right? Go with me also in Genesis to Genesis 37. This is, this is Joseph. This is the story of Joseph, story of Joseph, Genesis 37 in verse 7. Joseph, he's telling his story of his dream, and he says, For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. You're binding sheaves in the field. He's talking about wheat. So they had a huge wheat crop, and lo, my sheep arose rose, and stood upright, and behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheep. So they were really been out of shape when he told them this. But this was a, this was a prophecy that God gave to him, but the prophecy came in the form of something that naturally happens, which is the gathering of sheep, not the standing up of the sheep, but simply the gathering of sheep. All right? Go with me to Genesis 41. Genesis 41. Genesis 41, verses 48 and 49. Notice what it says. And he gathered up all the food of seven years which were in the land of Egypt and laid up food for the cities and food of the field. So they had a day, even though Egypt had a lot of cities, they had a lot of open space where they had to grow food, which was round about every city. And he laid up in store and Joseph gathered corn as the sand of the sea very much until he left numbering, for it was without number. So God has promised that just like he blessed Joseph, he will bless us if we will put our hands out there to the work that God has given us. There is There are special blessings in the earth. And, beloved, we are coming very quickly to a time when there will be food shortages in America because of this this COVID-19 virus, many of the people that harvest are sick, and many of them are afraid to go to work. So, therefore, a lot of the harvest is in the field or will be in the field and will rot. There's going to come, even before that, a meat shortage because a lot of the processing plants are gradually closing down because they don't have workers. So... We should have been vegetarians a hundred years ago anyhow, so hopefully hopefully that's a bridge that you have already crossed. 
Now, here's another very significant principle um, in living in the country. Exodus, Genesis, and then Exodus, Exodus chapter 23. Very interesting. Look at this. Exodus chapter 23, verses 10 to 12. Notice this. And it says, And six years shall thou sow in the land, and shall gather the fruits thereof. But the seventh year thou shalt let it rest and lie still, that the poor of thy people may eat what and what they leave the beasts of the field shall eat. In like manner thou shalt deal with thy vineyard and with thine olive yard. Olive yard. Six days shall thy do work, and on the seventh day thou shalt rest. And thine ox and thy ass may rest, and thy handmaid and thy stranger may be refreshed. All right, so so notice this. When when you are farming or when you are gardening, that spot of land that you're gardening, you count out six years. So if you start right now, if the world is still going to be here, we don't know that yet. But if you start right now, this is 2020. Okay, so you got 2020. You know, you got 2021, 22, 23, 24, 25. So that's six years. 2026, you don't plow that land. You let that land rest. Even the ground has to rest. And God has blessed that when you let that ground rest that year and you come back the year after that and farm, it's going to produce even more. This is very amazing as God, and this is one of the reasons why the Jews got lay, allowed to go into slavery because they did not keep the Sabbath, the weekly Sabbath. They did not keep the sabbatical year, and they did not let their, their servants go free on the seventh year. They didn't do it. So God said, okay, since you don't understand that I mean business, then he allowed them to go into captivity for 70 years, and 70 years is 10 times 7. So God is very, very serious about everything he says, country living, the sabbatical year, the day of the Sabbath, all of that. If you, if you had an ox, and you plow with your ox, and somebody comes to you, on Friday evening and say, let me use your ox tomorrow. He said, well, no, I'm sorry, my ox is keeping the Sabbath. I know that they'll look at you like you're crazy, but this is what the Bible teaches. Go with me to um, Leviticus 25, Leviticus 25, verses 1 to 7. Leviticus 25, verses 1 to to seven. The Lord spake unto Moses in Mount Sinai, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. Six years shalt thy sow the field. Six years shalt thy prune thy vineyard and gather the fruit thereof. And in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the Lord, a Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field, nor prune thy vineyard. That which groweth of its own accord of thy harvest, thou shalt not reap. Neither So in other words, you're supposed to have gathered up all your food. Everything that's left out there, that's supposed to be for the widow and the stranger and all of that, all right? Gather the grapes of the vine, undress, for it is the year of rest unto the land. And the Sabbath of the land shall be meet for you and for thee and for thy servant, and for thy maid, and for thy hired servant, and for thy stranger that sojourneth with thee, and for thy cattle, and for the beasts that are in the land, and all the increase thereof be meet. So, so God had this whole plan. So once every seven years, debts were to be released. 
All right, God had his whole plan for the Jews. But this this time for the land to rest is actually part of the health law because the land will be more healthy. That's why a lot of the food in America, they have to put so many chemicals in the ground because they have farmed the land to death. The land does not get a chance to rest, and so God does not bless it to produce as it should produce. So this is where we are today. All right, go with me to um, <coughs> excuse me, um, Leviticus. No, I'm sorry, Ecclesiastes 11. Ecclesiastes 11. Ecclesiastes 11 and verse 6. Ecclesiastes 11 and verse 6. Ecclesiastes 11, verse 6. And the scripture says, In the morning sow thy seed, and in the evening withhold not thine hand. For thou knowest not whether shall prosper either this or that, whether they both shall be alike good. So, so God is letting us know that we have a work to do, both a physical work as well as a spiritual work. The, the, when we look at country living, we're actually looking at what we would call environmental reform. We need as much as possible to provide an environment for ourselves, for our children, for our loved ones, our friends, our neighbors, where spirituality can grow. I was raised in a city, and I can tell you that by the time I was eight or nine, I was already corrupted. Had it not been for the mercy of a loving Heavenly Father that reached down to my condition, and brought me up, I certainly would have self-destructed. At some point in time, maybe in the future, I'll give you a portion of my personal testimony as to how God delivered me from the world. Because it indeed was a terrible struggle, but the Holy Spirit is very powerful and knows how to reach the hearts of men and women. So when we think about country living, it is much bigger than just for ourselves. Maybe God will place us in a position where we will be in a position to help provide places for others to be also, and also where we will be able to help to educate those that are desirous of understanding the will of God. Because, beloved, as we look around, we can see time winding down very quickly. And so we must take it upon ourselves to begin to prepare very quickly. We must not prepare. We must not depend upon pulpit declarations because many of the pulpits of today are now dumbed down almost to silence. So it is necessary that we understand the message and move out by faith. Men and women doing the work of God so that the end can come. So I trust that we will take these things to heart very, very seriously. Um, um, next week, uh, I think that we will look at we will look at Revelation chapter two and Revelation chapter three. That's the seven churches. So if you would take time to read that beforehand, it would it would help you out as we study through that. Um, it might be a two part series. We'll just see how how much of it we can cover. But remember, next week, we're going to look at Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, which is the seven churches. May God bless us and keep us, and let us all surrender ourselves fully to Christ. Let us pray as we close. Father in heaven, we're thankful once again for this day. We are thankful, Lord, that you have given us an opportunity for environmental reform where we can literally have a place away from the cities where we need not be distracted by the things that take place 
in the in the in the midst of the wicked world. We ask that you would use us as soul winners to be a blessing to others, and as you are using us to save others, save us also. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 Um, I like that environmental uh, services and. Um, Thank you so much for crying aloud and sparing not. Truly, today was the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Um, Pastor Martin telling us to, uh, from the word of God, uh, how we will be blessed getting out of these cities. And I will close out with the mid discord and strife. A voice was heard from the wilderness. A voice startling and stern, yet full of hope. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's taken from the desire of ages, page 104. I hope to see everybody back soon. Okay, good day.